happen. We are live. Caleb is with me tonight. We have a super freaky, scary show tonight. It is October, which is, of course, the month of Halloween and Samhain and all of the dark, uh, creepy people, all of the things that Holly and I exposed in the uh, Salem witchcraft stuff and the, their their one day that the Satanists love to celebrate and that uh, they get to mock everybody for because they go around celebrating Halloween, not knowing what it really means and all. We're going to bring some light to that today. And uh, I'm going to just say viewer discretion is advised for this episode. Some of this stuff is going to be pretty dark and pretty scary, uh, not, uh, you know, something that uh, young people should probably be listening to right away. Um, Kevin Carr, thank you so much for the uh, $10 uh, donation just now. I really appreciate that. Um, so, you know, basically what uh, Caleb and I are going to be discussing is the history of, of vampirism and human sacrifice. It ties into uh, the Hebraic Old Testament and the or so-called Old Testament and the origins uh, tie in directly to human and animal sacrifices and all of the biblical instances uh, that I discovered, which we'll be going into. And this may end up being a two-part series, but all of the biblical references that I discovered uh, from the Old Testament were about uh, it was ordered by God to not eat blood and that obviously those who would be the Satanists would go ahead and eat the blood. They would defy uh, natural law or, or the laws of Moses by eating the blood, and we'll get into explaining that. Uh, but they would eat the blood, and then in the New Testament, we find that Jesus is the final sacrifice, and nobody is to eat the blood again. And so, uh, again, we'll be covering all of that. <clears throat> uh, for those of you who like to play the drinking game, uh, this is going to uh, put you guys under the table tonight. Uh, <laughs> so I apologize for m the many uh, Huxley references in advance. So maybe you should give up drinking rather than playing the drinking game uh, every time we mention Huxley. So anyway, Caleb, welcome back. Thanks, Greg. Glad to be back as always. Um, so today uh, we're going to be talking about vampires. Um, you know, a lot of people are going to be like, what? Vampires are real? What does that mean? Um, where we're going to be going into is the uh, roots of the myth, trying to figure out what are the foundations of the myth, uh, give you guys some grammar. We, we found a whole bunch of uh, new grammar on, on the subject matter. Um, we're definitely not going to be able to hit all of it today so we'll probably do a couple parts but uh right off the bat one of the things that uh very interesting that i found a, quite a long time ago actually was uh garlic have you uh ever thought about what the reference to garlic is uh well if you asked me that day before yesterday i would have said no your dogs are going a bit crazy over there uh, yeah, i'm gonna mute for just a second yeah oh. Uh, but uh, as far as garlic, <clears throat> excuse me, before day before yesterday, I would have said no. Uh, yesterday, I did post up that garlic is a poison. And apparently, at least uh, secondhand speaking, I don't have any firsthand primary citations for that. But uh, that will probably show up soon as it usually does. But apparently, uh, in World War One and World War Two, bullets were coated with garlic. Uh, before being uh, shot. And then when the bullet entered the person, the garlic would poison the person. Garlic, when you eat it like snake venom, is not uh, poisonous, but if it gets directly into the bloodstream, it's apparently poisonous and ca it also causes all sorts of uh, mental issues. And we see garlic in so many things today. Uh, how are the dogs doing? Can you unmute now? Yeah, I unmuted. All, all right. right. So sorry about that. So uh, yeah, so I first came across uh, the work of Dr. Bob Beck quite a long time ago, and he was uh, he put out a video, he put out a, he went to a conference and did a talk all about uh, all his research. And he briefly mentions garlic in there, which kind of led me to do my own research, uh, which uh, led me to just 
give up garlic completely quite a long time ago, five years ago. Um, after I, after I had been an advocate of using it for all the different various medical uses that the alternative health people are always uh, touting about how it is a, um, antibacterial, anti, you know, this and that. Antibiotic. Exactly. Being bio, being life, anti-life. Hello. Exactly. So one of the reasons it's important to bring this up here is it ties right into this idea. Okay. Um, vampires, blood, they drink blood. Um, why, why is, why is there the association? What am I talking about? Well, the actual garlic, if it ever gets into your blood will, um, be neurotoxic. It'll kill brain cells and, uh, it passes the corpus callosum. It can, uh, it has all kinds of devastating effects. Just go watch the Bob Beck video on YouTube. Google it. It's like five minutes long. He kind of, uh, so it's all the not even that. that. I think it's like three and a half minutes. So you really can't struggle through it like my shows. Mm -hmm. So exactly. And then on top of that, my research, um, well, in my own personal experience uh, as well, I'll add that I used to use garlic as a pesticide, as a gardener quite a bit. And uh, if you think about pesticide, a side is a killer. Um, you know, what do you think it's doing to the inside of your body if you're putting it in there? A lot of people are like, well, it's got antibacterial effects. Well, antibacterial, I don't like the way that, uh, I don't like, per, you know, personally, I'm kind of, uh, you know, I, I think people are aware about my beliefs about uh, the germ theory and the environment theory a little bit. If you're not, I'm, uh, I, I'm yeah. not an advocate of killing uh, parts of the body in a war type atmosphere, like, like germs or invaders and all these things. I'm more of an advocate of the environment creates, it, it's like an epic, uh, epigenetic type right. of a si situation where the environment breeds the certain things in your body to be the way that they are. And if you have a bad environment, you're going to have bad, so, bad bacteria. And so, uh, garlic essentially, you know, apparently you could use it to say to poison a bullet or something and entering the bloodstream, it has a totally different effect. Now I love garlic and now I'm gonna to have to be reconsidering that entirely. I know Dave Asprey was putting out uh, stuff against garlic, uh, you know, some years back. So interesting that uh, that all comes full circle because garlic is of course used to kill uh vampires and so uh you know and you put the garlic on a steak or whatever you know you kill a, a vampire with a steak but garlic around the neck and stuff like that so now it starts actually making sense aha why would you use garlic so uh those connections come together now um for uh all right so let's just get right to the chase uh, one of the first books that the uh, cia published for mk ultra for the mk ultra program was a uh, little book called Doors of Perception, published by a guy by the name, maybe you've all heard of him by now, Aldous Huxley. He was, of course, one of the chief architects of the CIA's MKUltra program, worked with British MI6, was an overall uh, sociopath and megalomaniac, and uh, you know he was responsible for the indirect murder of probably millions of people at this point uh, he was a social engineer a eugenicist his brother was a big eugenicist founded unesco the world wildlife fund etc uh, of course uh, huxley's grandfather uh, was uh, thomas henry huxley who is the propaganda manager for uh, charles darwin and so uh, here we go and uh, so this is actually from the introduction of the doors of perception you don't even have to get beyond the introduction actually the third page of the actual book which they're calling page 11 there are matters rested until two or three years ago a new and perhaps highly significant fact was observed actually the fact had been staring everyone in the face for several decades but nobody as it happened had noticed it until young english until a young english psychiatrist at present working in canada was struck by the close similarity in chemical composition between mescaline and adrenaline. Further research revealed that lysergic acid, which of course is LSD, 
an extremely potent hallucinogen derived from ergot was a structural biochemical re- uh, was a structural biochemical relationship to the others. Then came the discovery that adrenochrome, which is a product of the decomposition of adrenaline, can produce many of the symptoms of dirt. Uh, observed in mescaline intoxication, but adrenochrome probably occurs spontaneously in the human body. In other words, one, may, uh, one of us may be capable of manufacturing a chemical, minute doses of which are known to cause profound changes in consciousness. Certain of these changes are similar to those which occur in the most characteristic plague of the 20th century, schizophrenia. Is the mental disorder due to the chemical disorder? And is the chemical disorder due in turn to psychological distress, distress affecting the adrenals? It would be rash and premature to affirm it. The most one can say is that some kind of prima facie case has been made out. Meanwhile, the clue is being systematically followed, the sleuths, biochemists, psychiatrists, psychologists are all on the trail. And so, you know, what we have here is the, you know, the the, tr- the chief architect, in my opinion, all the research I've done, Huxley was the chief architect behind the MK Ultra program, saying that they're, they've discovered adrenochrome, that the effects are similar to mescaline, now, who was it who gave Aldous Huxley his dose of mescaline for his book, Doors of Perception? Now, by golly, ladies and gentlemen, you may be su- surprised to find out that it was his personal doctor, a guy by the name of Dr. Humphrey Osmond. And so uh, Humphrey Osmond, and let me see if I can find him in my notes here. Now, Humphrey Osmond, he... Uh, this guy, uh, good grief. So anyway, we're going to turn to uh, Huxley's Moksha. And it says, uh, uh, and this is Aldous Huxley writing to Dr. Humphrey Osmond, which is letter 182 in the letters of Aldous Huxley. Uh, sorry, folks. Uh, I'm sure you're probably already getting hammered. But um, he says, I hope your administrative difficulties have been resolved and that you are now free to set on with something more interesting. I'm glad to hear that the Russians, I'm glad to hear that the Russians have picked up on your adrenochrome work. And, uh, you know, and you can also find that in Aldous Huxley Moksha, page 175. So, hmm, Cold War, Humphrey Osmond, Aldous Huxley's personal doctor. Aldous Huxley heads the CIA's MK Ultra program. His own personal doctor is sharing secrets with the Russians about his adrenochrome research. Okay. Hmm. So, you know, uh, anyway, so then we go on here. Jay Stevens. This is from the book uh, Storming heaven and i don't have the exact page number because i copied and pasted out of a pdf version but that's how this is going to be out of this book here and uh oh good grief um you want to mute that for a second and so he says a number of theories were ventured but one that concerns us here is the adrenochrome theory of two english psychiatrists humphrey osmond and john smythes huh now who were the guys that created the words psychedelic and psychotomimetic and phenarathime and uh, hallucinogen and all of these. Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah. It was Dr. Humphrey Osman and Dr. John Smythes, whom I exposed in 2014 and in my article in Theogen's What's in a Name, working with MKUltra. I think that was uh, MKUltra subproject uh, 49 that Osman worked on or 47. But uh, so let's see, he was uh, MKUltra Subproject 47 and MKUltra Subproject 111. And we have uh, his letterhead turning up in CIA documents that people can download off of the CIA website, et cetera, in the uh, publicly released MKUltra uh, uh, documents. But here's Dr. Hum- Humphrey Osmond. We have adrenochrome theory here, Aldous Huxley right here, Aldous Huxley heading. 
MK Ultra and all this stuff, a big time occultist, OTO, et cetera, Satanist uh, et al. Uh, so anyway, this uh, goes on. Uh, the first, let me just minimize this. Uh, the first schizophrenic Humphrey Osmond ever treated was a girl who told him that whenever she looked in a mirror, what she saw was an elephant. As soon as she left, Osmond trotted off to his superior to tell him of this very odd delusion. Well, what you know, uh, well, you know what she has is schizophrenia, his boss said. What's that? Uh, Osmond asked. He'd heard of it, of course. Or, yeah, he'd heard of it, of course. And then skipping down. Uh, let's see. So they decided to concentrate on the aminochromes, which were formed when adrenaline decomposes naturally. One of these aminochromes, or, or uh, one of these aminochromes, adrenochrome, seemed a likely candidate as it is a molecular structure surprisingly similar to mescaline. So, and I heard uh, uh, Gino Denning at one point, uh, who of course brought me the trivium, uh, he had a theory at one point that when the moil uh, sucks on the, excuse me, sucks on the baby's penis for the uh, Jewish circumcision ri ritual, uh, he, he suspected that it might actually be DMT, but what we're discovering here is that it was adrenochrome. And so uh, we're going to be spiraling down further into all of this nasty, creepy, dark stuff. So, again, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, Osmond swallowed his first adrenochrome in 1952. After 10 minutes, the ceiling changed color. And whenever he closed his eyes, it, he was overwhelmed by a swarm of dots, which merged and fled with the kind of shifting pointillism one finds in a school of fish. Someone pulled out a pack of Rothschild cards, and Osmond astounded himself with the inventive shapes he was able to discover. Walking back down the corridors of the hospital, stop, what? Walking back down the corridors of the hospital, Osmond was amazed at how sinister they seemed. Okay, so he's in a hospital, and this is, <laughs> hold on, I don't want to give it away yet. Uh, so Osman was amazed at how sinister they seemed. What they all, uh, what did all the cracks in the floor mean? And why were there so many of them? His colleagues were delighted with his be behavior. This certainly was a model of psychosis. So they're trying to create psychosis. Why would they be trying to create psychosis? Key, okay, MK Ultra, Osmond, working with MK Ultra, working with CIA and MI6. Aldous Huxley's personal doctor, the biggest psychopath that may have ever walked the earth. And Osman watched them celebrating as though a form behind a thick glass wall. Osman was no longer in England when he was when he had his adventure with adrenochrome. In mid-1952, he accepted a job in the Canadian province of Saskatchewan as the clinical director of Saskatchewan Hospital. Clinical Director of Saskatchewan Hospital. The place was touted as the finest mental hospital on the prairies, although this was something of a joke since it was the only mental hospital on the prairies. Actually, the place was so rank, so depressing 19th century uh, madhouse, that when Osmond and his colleagues received the APA Silver Plaque Award for the most improved mental hospital, American Customs declared the before pictures to be obscene and special dispensation had to be obtained before they were allowed into the country so okay so here is let's let me get this straight folks you have a drug that's caused by fear and adrenaline and all of this and humphrey osman a cia doctor working in the saskatchewan mental hospital where people would be having psychotic experiences that would create floods of adrenochrome somehow has a supply of this stuff there at the hospital. And not only that, he's testing it on himself. So why is he testing it on himself? Of course, Jay Stevens just glosses over that. But that should be key also. you know. And then Dr. Humphrey Osman goes and gives Aldous Huxley his first dose of mescaline. And then Aldous Huxley compares the mescaline to adrenochrome 
in the introduction of the doors of perception. So I'm just going to toss this out, folks. Here we have an elite group of people, the social engineers of society, who know about adrenochrome and are researching it. And, you know, they just happen to be the elite class that are trying to dumb the rest of us down. Now, I'm just saying, you know, but uh, here we have our first instance of even Aldous Huxley and Humphrey Osmond being vampires. And so what we have is, you know, it's, it's you know, the, the television and the movies have spun to create a cover story for what vampirism really is. And, you know, so it, the vampires do drink blood. They do get off on it. It does create a drug high, as we've just shown. And I have more citations here on uh, this as well. But uh, all of this shows that, you know, that the people behind MKUltra, these, these six psychopaths who were social engineering the rest of society, trying to create a, uh, kill us off in these eugenics programs and mind controlling us, at all were related to vampiric behavior. And I'm going to throw it over to you for a few minutes and let you take over there, Caleb. Wow. So, <clears throat> so these guys are taking adrenal adrenochrome like a drug so that they can uh, trip out on it. Like, uh, like it's acid and it's got similar effects. I'm very interested in the effect that you're talking about with the the, is adrenaline some sort of a precursor to a hallucinogenic experience and how that all works? I'm really interested in this research now. So these are modern day people that we're talking about now. Um, one would uh, logically start to try to figure out where, where did this custom come from? How, how long has it been going on? Stuff like that. So uh, my research led me to, um, you know, there's so many different places. I don't even know where to start. One of the, one of the earlier things that, that, uh, obviously pops up when you start to do this sort of research is, um, vaccines and abortions and stuff like that. You start to notice that it's really interesting how, when you go to the doctor, um, uh, to, to give blood, um, you know, it's, where does all that blood go? How do we know for sure that all that blood is, is going to where we think it is for donation and et cetera. Um, you start to wonder what's really going on deep and in, in, if they're doing some really, uh, sick stuff in these mental hospitals, who knows what else is going on here. Now, you know, you start, this is where we start getting really dark when we start to figure out you know, how deep this rabbit hole really goes. Um, and, and, and are these people actually drinking blood? What are they doing with it? Um, the first references that you come up with, um, when you start studying vampires, one of them is Elizabeth Bathroy, um, who is the blood countess, uh, the blood countess of I'm going to show her on screen while you're talking there. Go ahead. Sorry. So, uh, this lady is very interesting. Um, first I'll just mention what the folklore says about her. And as far as like, you know, just mainstream type information says about her, um, like let's get to the, the nitty gritty stuff here. So she's, uh, basically gets accused of, Uh, killing a whole, basically the most murderous woman in history, uh, is attributed to her name. Okay. Well, so some she's got, 650 murders that she did. Yeah. 650 murders. Okay. So, and this happens around 1602 to 1604. Um, now, uh, one of the things that you'll start to realize when you read all this is that, um, Elizabeth is also suspected of cannibalism. She starts, uh, she, they talk about how she has ties to uh, the Kabbalah, the rituals of the Kabbalah um, with, you know, bathing in blood, drinking young, blood. Young blood. Young, and it's always young blood. That's one that's of the what, things. That's why, and, and I belong in the kitchen just pointed out, oh my God, that's why they do 
uh, or they do blood drives in the high schools, young blood. She's already starting to piece it together. Yeah, this is some really sick stuff, guys. So let's <sighs> try to get through this. Um, now, I will say that um, once you... Once I started digging real deep into the, this Elizabeth Bathroy person, um, I started noticing certain things that uh, I've seen before where certain groups of people try to cover up their tracks um, with misdirections, especially on like the official Wikipedia of these people and such. One of the things you'll notice is that um, all this stuff takes place in the Habsburg monarchy. Yeah, okay, so she's, you know, they're, they're saying they're trying to blame this on um, the Slavs, the, uh, this is the uh, Transylvania, um, the uh, family, Moldovia, Transylvania, yeah, the Moldovia family. Okay, so the, the top, the thing that I've figured out, mostly from Fomenko's methods, um, Anatoly Fomenko is a guy, if, if you don't know about him, please go check him out get as much grammar as you can before you just start, you know, making up your mind about whether it's, it's legit or not. His methods, as far as I'm concerned, are pretty sound. And I've, now that I'm uh, pretty savvy to his methods, uh, I've been, I've been trying to cross reference his, his methods across other work. And, uh, he, you know, this is not, necessarily his work per se when I when I'm talking about this lady in particular however he does make a very strong case that the Habsburg monarchy is actually uh, a reflection of an uh, of a middle medieval um, Russian Empire with uh, I, Ivan the Terrible and etc and that's uh, a big subject that uh, has a lot of grammar but um, I realize it, it, it's kind of difficult for people to make some of these jumps with me being so um, general when I'm saying this stuff. But all I want to get across is that I believe that this woman may have actually been a reflection of the story of Esther from the Bible, which would make a whole lot of sense because it would then link her and this family to the rest of the uh, atrocities throughout history that I keep linking them to and i'll get into more of the uh links uh, you know after this um you know sometimes you, you run across something you're like well why doesn't this fit into the puzzle piece well uh, a little bit more grammar and sure enough it fits and where it fits is uh that the habsburg uh, uh monarchy that she's that people are claiming her to be involved in is if if i'm correct and that Fomenko's work is true about the story of Esther from the Bible being an actual story about a medieval um, Elena Volenshenka is the name of the of the of the real name of the story of Esther. Well, then that links this to the Purim, which is a really big deal because the Purim is uh, was a Jewish holiday that they celebrate that ended basically in the slaughter of uh the people uh, of haman the people of haman and, uh, the, the, book the of, actual christians and and people should read the book of esther for yourselves uh so that you can understand it esther's uncle mordecai has esther lie and it's not a very long uh book here as you can see it's only 10 chapters but esther's uncle mordecai has her lie to the king and to gain her favor she's you know like the most beautiful woman the king divorces his wife and he ends up marrying Esther and uh you know so uh Esther's uh, last well uh, Haman figures out uh what the what the Jews were doing and that Mordecai had had Esther lie and and Haman goes to the king to tell him but the king had granted Esther one wish and so just before Haman is able to tell the king everything that's uh, happening, if I remember the chronology of the story right. Esther is granted her one wish, and, the, and her wish is to have all of Haman's 56 or 70,000 people or whatever they were uh, killed. And so Haman, all of his sons, and everybody are killed, and then the Jews take over that land. And this happens, again, uh, just before Haman... Uh, tells the king what's happening. And so 
Uh, this is celebrated every year to still to this day uh, in the in the Jewish holiday called the Purim. Now, what Holly and I discovered, or what I had discovered, was that the uh, word Puritan comes from the word Purim, and the Puritans were escaping England, and there was the evil king, and you know they were getting to the new land, and they compared the stories, their story, their plight, their flee from Europe for the human sacrifices that they were doing, ding, 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 which is going to tie into vampirism as well as usury and creating the plagues, which Holly and I covered in our shows on the Puritans being Jews, creating the plagues and witchcraft. That's what the witch's cauldron is about. This is Halloween, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the reason why they put this stuff in your face every year at Halloween is because they are mocking you. They put the 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 celebration of these genocides and mass plagues right in your faces and then they they celebrate them and they mock us and everybody is the people go around to collect candy at people's doors which was how the witches would lure the children to the doors to uh it appears to uh be able to poison them and to test their their witches bruise on them and if you want to know what one of the witches bruise was Read the uh, story of Mac, uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth, Boil, Boil, Toil, and Trouble. It's laid out right there. You add in uh, feces and cinnabar, which is mercury ore, and you uh, begin to see the entire thing starting to play out. So, um, you know, so the Puritans, of course, it all starts tying together into research that we've already done and the Huxley family and adrenochrome and all of this stuff. So I just... You know, because Holly and I had done that research and covered that and the witchcraft or the, you know, the history of Salem shows, etc. cetera, uh, I just wanted to uh, give a little more detail on that. So back to you, Caleb. Yeah, and also uh, I'll have to send this right back to you because I'm going to ask you for the citation here now uh, on Elizabeth Bathroy, even if you just believe the official story of what they say on Wikipedia and you're not... Uh, into the whole narrative that I'm talking about, the other narrative, it still claims right here in her early years on Wikipedia that Elizabeth was raised a Protestant Calvinist. And if you don't know uh, the history of the Protestant Calvinists, I'll let Jan say a little bit about that. Well, the, the Calvinists were apparently Jewish and... Sorry, hold on, let me just unpile this book here underneath the stack here sorry i should have organized these in order oh there goes the telephone all right so we have this book and i've shown this book before this is the judaizing calvin uh and this book is about 500 years old digius uh hunius which is probably a pseudonym who knows but what they do is they go through and they show how calvinism was really a jewish break off of christianity uh, what the Puritans and other groups, uh, crypto Jewish groups, did to, in order to stay in Europe and other places where the Jews were being kicked out because of the human sacrifices and plagues and vampirism and things like that, uh, they would uh, put on pseudo forms of Christianity like Calvinism and like many of the Lutheran forms of Christianity and Protestant forms of Christianity. So the, and they would be able to quote some things, but they weren't Christian. They were just using it as a, a cloak. And so, you know, this book goes into uh, how Calvin was essentially uh, just, you know, uh, Judaic Christianism, as I coined it. They call it Christian Judaicism, which is an inversion. It's Judaic Christianism. So, you know, we have to invert their lies so that we... Underst you know, it's a Kabbalistic inversion how they did that. So once we understand that, we can see it and begin to uh, understand it. And thanks to uh, uh, Brian and uh, who is the other one, um, Polygonal for the uh, donations. I think there was another one just now for a dollar. Thanks, uh, Giovanni, as well. I appreciate all of your support. Everybody, please uh, throw up. And then uh, Holly says in the chat, Puritans collected moss on human bodies and then consumed it as medicine. And that's part of the corpse uh, medicine uh, that uh, we learned while we were doing research in Salem. So anyway, back to you, Caleb. Yeah, OK. So um, one thing here, maybe I'll uh, share this screen here so people can see this reference here. OK, so. 
Uh, one of the references I found here, um, this is a blog, Truth Zone forum. It's just a forum people are talking about. So here's one uh, a group of people that have figured out that you'll read right here that this Elizabeth Bathory, they call her the blood Jewess. Um, they've got a bunch of information in here talking about how her practices were steeped in the Kabbalah uh, with bathing and drinking the blood of others to keep her young, young being, blood, young being. And we would call that Satanism. So um, we've got this girl linked to these these blood libels is what uh, we're calling them here. So now this is, uh, you know, in the 1600s, okay? Now, um, further on down the line, we get to Vlad the Impaler. Uh, I have a ton of grammar to get through for Vlad. Uh, I was just telling Jan, I, d I didn't even have enough time to get to prepare for as much stuff that I found on Vlad today. Um, and I'm probably going to have to do a whole nother show just to go through all of it because there is so much about him as far as um, the controversies involved in whether or not he was um, – actually you know doing some of these things uh who he was doing them to the story the, the, some of the grammar that i have to present later is pretty interesting stuff but i don't want to give it all away because i'm not 100 percent on it yet i still need to make sure but i will say you'll see right here multiple references to moldavia just like the other references we were just showing before with uh, the other lady so Elizabeth and Vlad the Impaler might have a similar uh, type of a situation where you can use Fomenko's uh, methods and link them over and figure out what was really going on there um, in history. This might be a cover up. Uh, one of the one of the pieces of grammar that I found earlier was a uh, red ice interview on Vlad the Impaler, and uh, you know he's. They, they do a pretty good job of going through some history without having the Fomenko stuff. They do miss the mark, I believe. So I, I, I'm going to have to go through and uh, take Fomenko's methods and uh, try to plot these people and fit them into the narrative and see how it, see how it works out. That's going to be a whole bunch of extra work in the future. Um, but as far as down from the line from this, you get to... Sabataya Zevi. Um, and so right after this lady in the, in the early 1600s, then you get, so if I'm correct, then the story of, of the Purim and all of this timeline happens with Elena Volenchenka, AE, the story of, of Esther or Judith in the Bible. And if people want more grammar on that, I have a ton of of grammar uh, screenshotted with a ton of notes with all the primary sources that can link uh, Lena Volenchenka. Would you, uh, uh, Esther, s scroll up a second and show uh, folks that image that you just showed? That's one of the ones that we you didn't know. scroll back down. Uh, oh, with the blood libel. Yep. This one. Yeah. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so this is actually them causing massive uh, bleeding in the children that they would use, and they would extract the blood from them. But this is why the 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 Moyle rabbi sucks the baby's penis uh, during the circumcision, is he's getting off on the adrenochrome uh, that, uh, and you can see them here. They're actually cutting the baby's penis there, uh, but uh, they're getting off on the adrenochrome in the blood from that. Yeah. So the, the dark part about this is we're starting to realize that, you know, the, the modern day adrenochrome stuff might just be a further continuation of some of this stuff from the past here. Um, and you know, this is some dark stuff. Why are, why are these people doing this? What are they doing? So if, if, if it has to do with the adrenal glands and they're, what they do is they scare and they torture, uh, these people so that are these young, these, these young people, they kidnap, however, they get these, these victims so that when they, it's, it's trauma, they traumatize them. And once they traumatize them, it, 
it gets into the blood, the adrenaline goes into the blood, something happens where, you know, they know they they can drink the blood and, you know, they, they almost view it as a, a source of energy. So that's where these myths are coming from. So what we're saying here is that the actual myths of these vampires have some foundation in history. And what I'm saying is some of these people that they're blaming to be the vampires from these movies and from these myths might be a misdirection. And the actual vampires uh, may in fact be, you know, covering it up, the people who do, who have been doing this. And what I'm basically saying is that the, this is a ritual that's been going on for a very long time. And I'll, uh, uh, I'll just say that a lot of grammar, if you want a lot of grammar, if you guys can see this, uh, it's a documentary called Jewish ritual murder. Um, it's, it's dark. I know it's, it's hard to get through some of this stuff, uh, you know, and yeah, there you go. The, the, there's uh, one down there. You have uh, the rabbi explains the importance of slurping baby blood, you know. Yeah, this is some really dark stuff, guys, but it does need to be looked at. We need to understand our enemies and we need to figure out what their crimes are. You know, we got to do some investigative. This is some dark research. satanic stuff. But I do recommend you get go ahead and get the um, grammar. I'll get as much grammar. Uh, I've presented a whole bunch of stuff here. I'd like for people to do a little bit of homework and start looking into some of this grammar here. Uh, there's uh, there's a Sandra Bullock and uh, uh, Ellen DeGeneres uh, degenerate interview where they're talking about putting the circumcision skin of babies' penises on their face as facial creams. I mean, this is some really messed up stuff. There's a bunch of uh, rabbis that have been accused of kidnapping torture. Uh, go ahead and watch all these t and, you know, do the investigation for yourself. Don't take my word for it. It's not, uh, you know, just, you know, don't get caught into emotional buzzwords like, you know, anti-Semitism or something like this. Look at the actual research. And, you know, these uh, court cases have been going on. You know, there are many, many records of these types of court cases going back 500 years or more. Yes, sir. All right. And now um, I guess I'll talk just for a little bit about, sorry for jumping around. I'd like to go back to what I would say is the earlier links to uh, linking paganism, Judaism, and all these different uh, sacrificial uh, human sacrifices back to the earliest forms that we can find in history with, uh, with, references and I, so i took this reference here from the uh one of the pages on uh, anatoly fomenko's new book called how it was in reality so he says in the 12th through 13th century all three places enjoyed great respect here numerous pilgrims used to arrive it was the time of royal christianity christ was worshiped and and was called Zeus, Dionysus, Apollo, etc. Mother Mary of God was also referred to by different ancient names in Jerusalem, which is Zargrod, in Bacos, Golgotha, and also in Crimea, the ancient temples and shrines dedicated to Andronicus Christ were erected, who is uh, uh, the, the actual person who lived, who, who uh, embodied the teachings of Christ from the Bible, his name, his, uh, medieval name andronicus he was an emperor uh, blood sacrifices would take place there among them quite possibly human ones such as the character of royal christianity at that time after the victory of the apostolic christianity the royal christianity began to be called the primal judaism and paganism okay so anatoly fomenko is linking paganism to Judaism. I, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news to all you guys out there who are really into pagan, paganist beliefs. Um, Renegade but, radio at all, all of you people that think paganism predates Christianity, you need to look a little bit deeper. And we're going to be going into a lot more research on why uh, paganism can, uh, stems from Judaism and not, you know, it's not a precursor to Christianity. If you have to understand logos 
And once you understand logos, then that would be the thesis. The antithesis would be all of these other things that come afterward, really. But, uh, you know, so uh, you have all of these pagan practices of blood rituals and sacrifices and drugs and all of this stuff. Well, what are we talking about right here, folks? Yep. So, so what happens at the end of the 14th century? So this is important because it gives us a timeline for all of this stuff, okay, that we read about in the Bible. Um, at the end of the 14th century, after the Battle of Kolkuvo in the great Mongolian Empire, the apostolic Christianity was adopted as the state religion. Okay, that's when the blood sacrifices were banned. From the end of the 14th century, royal Christianity was declared as paganism, primal Judaism. Okay, so paganism came out of the original Christianity. That is to say, a false cult, okay? Now, this cult's name was the Bacchanalian cult. So the, this Bacchanalian cult who worshipped Dionysus and, and uh, basically sex and, you know, um, all the, it was, a, it was a huge inversion of, of what Christianity originally meant. They invert it. And then, you know, so here we continue hostile, uh, uh, that to a false cult hostility to it began, which also afflicted the attitude to the former relics. The places of worship themselves were preserved because they were Christian, but terminology, ritualism, and many other things, which create the external appearance as well as the forms of customs changed as before the faithful, would arrive to visit the holy places. However, by then, they would generally be the apostles Christians. The former pagan past of the relics had begun to be forgotten and turned into a well-respected, but nevertheless, someone else's past. And they pushed it way back into antiquity so that they could cover up their tracks. That's what they did with history, folks. That's why this Fomenko stuff is so important. They're trying to cover up their past. And Fomenko gives us a lot of methods that allow us to re reconstruct this stuff so we can figure it out the new priests would slightly change their old names which would compound the confusion in people's minds eventually the christians were made to think that zeus apollo dionysus were some ancient deities and the deep past of bakos chafut kale and violent uh was by no means christian but in fact pagan okay so why is this important this is important because it shows um what i'm trying to show here is that what happened in the very beginning of the uh, Crusades, when they started, when they went to avenge the death of Christ, uh, this guy who is this polymath named Andronicus, what happened is they, they had these wars and the wars went back and forth and they kicked out all of the people from the empire. Uh, these are the stories that you get from, the money changers and the Bacchanalian cults, the Saturnalian cults, whatnot, and all these, all these people performing these sacrificial um, rituals. Okay. Now these sacrificial rituals, what happened is they, they end up going all the way throughout history under different cults, under the guise of different cults. Um, one of the cults that they go under was the uh, cult of the bull, the uh, Mithraic cult, um, the cult of Dionysus. These are, uh, these are all names of the cult that was worshiping the bull, okay? Now, there's a whole bunch of material I have on the bull specifically, but uh, as far, I, I don't want to segue too far off into any tangent. I'd like to get to the fact that these, these same groups of people like Sabbatai Azevi are these descendants of, so th these, this rabbi, by the way, if you don't know Sabbatai Azevi, he's this Jewish rabbi, uh, Sephardic ordained rabbi. One of the probably he's considered my, the Jewish Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, one of the most evil peoples ever to live in history, I would say. Uh, and I know that's a big, tall claim to make, but if you really look into him, You'll, I'm sure you'll agree with me. Look into a YouTube channel called The Rape of Justice. 
uh, does a pretty good job of, uh, you know, getting people on there like Henry Macau and such talking about the past of Sabotai Zevi. It's dark. I don't, uh, you know, it's, it's not something that I like to get into, but you know, if you want this grammar, you want to understand where these people came from and how this all happened. He's a key figure. Okay. So, uh, Zabatai Zevi, then you get into from Zabatai Zevi, you get into uh, Frank, Jacob Frank, um, and then the uh, Order of the Illuminati by Adam Weishaupt. These are all messiahs that claim to be reincarnations of, of the, the messiah. So this is what they believe. Okay. This is what they, I don't know what I believe, but I just want you to know what they believe. Okay. Now, uh, for more grammar, if you're interested in more grammar on that subject, I highly recommend you watch a YouTube documentary, a short documentary that you will have to, uh, let's see, it is, it is called uh, The Zion King, I believe. And there's, there are short excerpts of it that you can find that will give you... Um, here, let's see if I can find it real quick. That will give you a lot more grammar as far as who who these uh, bloodlines have continued to be. How how is the link between Princess Diana and uh, the Goldsmiths and the Rothschilds and all these people? It just you keep seeing the same patterns of people keep popping up. Uh, it's it's. Uh, there's also a documentary I would recommend right here called the synagogue of Satan. This will give you most of the grammar you need. Uh, and I don't have time to go over all of it. There's probably 10 hours of documentaries in here, but I just wanted to kind of lay that out for people who are interested in more grammar. Now, another interesting thing that you'll notice, um, in our recent history, the, uh, the Berlin in Berlin, uh, during the Weimar Republic, if you've studied World War II uh, in depth, you'll realize that uh, a lot of this same type of accusations were being made against these uh, same people, these, these same people throughout history that we're talking about the Jews. Now, these guys are... Um, oh, let, let me just interject, Caleb. Uh, you know, we had watched a documentary, Caleb had sent it to me, that shows that many, most of the Christian sainted children were actually victims of this uh, Jewish practice and blood sacrifice and that they were sainted because they were martyred uh, by the Jews in these rituals. And there are, you know, many dozens of uh, historical legal cases, et cetera, showing this. It's not just, you know, the it's always spun as just anti-Semitic stories, but when you get into it, these are real legal cases. There's real evidence. Of course, we don't have photographs and recordings of something from the 15 or 1600s or 1700s, etc. But, you know, as far as the t testimony of uh, two or more people establishing, uh, you know, uh, witnessing it and dead bodies and weapons and evidence, it's, it's there. So this isn't just some... Um, you know, anti-Semitic stuff. So what they have done is over the centuries, they've turned all of this stuff into stories of mythical vampires in order to cover up the the practice of the blood libel. They call it the libel as their cover word so that they're, you know, nobody uh, investigates this stuff. But, uh, you know, they create the stories to cover over the reality of the blood libel ritual so that people don't investigate it. And if you just use the word, oh, that's anti-Semitic, you know, 90% of the population, their brain will shut off and they won't look beyond that point. So you have to, you know, be willing to actually get into the facts. And thanks uh, both to Anthony and uh, Polygonal for their uh, donations just now. Uh, Fibonacci says, as well as Dr. Uh, John D, that's absolutely correct. He was you know, one of these guys who is involved in a lot of this stuff as well. So uh, Emanuel Swedenborg probably as well. All of the old um, spy masters, probably Hassani Sabah. But, um, you know, who knows how far it goes. But, you know, it's very interesting that even the CIA through Aldous Huxley start off, you know, kick off their MKUltra psychedelic revolution crap 
with adrenochrome in the introduction of Aldous Huxley's book, you know, Doors of, per- Doors of Perception. Mm-hmm. So anyway, go ahead. Oh, I was uh, about to ask you. So uh, I got I got my notes, but uh, before I go on to my notes about the uh, human sacrifice stuff, I wanted you to go ahead and read some of those Bible quotes from John and Corinthians, if you got those up. Okay, so are you, you? Well, we should probably read. What I should do is I want to give some preface to the Old Testament first before I jump to sure. the end. And thanks to uh, uh, Forty Six and Trump for the dollar ninety nine donation there. Thanks to all of you for all your support. And I'll throw the link up for uh, donating on the website too. You can also uh, you know support us on Patreon. That's a really big way, good way to support us as well. I love to see people support over there. And I'll try to start putting original content over there soon for uh, for him first. Yes, uh, Dr. John D. was a spy master for Queen Elizabeth, probably the first spy master. But, you know, Al- uh, Alistair Crowley, all of these guys were spy masters. Alistair Crowley was probably behind the creation of MI6, if I remember correctly. So uh, anyway, let's uh, thanks to Cantor, uh says, uh, good show, Jan and J- uh, <laughs> Caleb, excuse me. Uh, so anyway, let me get to these uh, citations here. And there's a lot of these. Now, first off, what I want to do is uh, s- say that or I'm going to start off with the definition of vampire, which, you know, we should probably define the terms. We probably should have started off with that to begin with. But mm-hmm. vampire from Magyar, vampire, a word of Slavonic origin occurring uh, in the same form in Russian, Polish, Czech, and uh, Serbian, and Bulgarian with such variants as uh, Bulgarian Vapir, Vapir, Ruthen Vapir, Vopir, Opir, R- Russian Upir, uh, Upir, Polish Upior, uh, Miklia, Mik- Miklosic, excuse me, my Serbian Yezik is getting old and unpracticed, uh, suggests North Turkish, North Turkish Uber, which now those of you who take an Uber, that means actually that's witch. That comes from witch or vampire. So that's uh, what they're doing. That's the joke with the uh, Uber going on right there. And uh, that's from the uh, OED there. I'll just I'll just show that here. I'm going to cover you up for a minute while I'm uh, discussing this stuff, Caleb. So uh, you can see uh, Uber witch right here. And uh, so uh, paternal being of malignant nature in the original and usual form of belief and reanimated corpse. Now, that's kind of uh, not so per se, you know, probably misdirection. Supposed to seek nourishment or do harm by sucking the blood of sleeping persons, a man or woman abnormally endowed with such sim- with similar habits. So, you know, obviously people who do human sacrifices are real. And a person of malignant or uh, loathsome character, especially one who preys ruthlessly upon others, a vile and cruel extractor or extortioner. So uh, anyway, uh, going on to Genesis here, uh, Genesis 9-4, but with the, uh, but the flesh... With the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall not uh, shall ye not eat. So, what is being uh, described in these uh, passages I'm about to read is that the blood is what gives you your life. It's what gives life and animation to your soul. So, when you slaughtered an animal to eat it, it was forbidden to eat or consume, drink the blood. You had to bloodlet the animal first. And then once that was done, then you could eat the meat of the animal. But because it was the life force, you didn't do that. So the Satanists, the vampires, the Aleister Crowley's in their ilk, they see that and they say, okay, well, you know, God forbids it. So we're going to go out. We're going to do it. And so they consume the blood. They figure out the adrenochrome theory, etc. So in Exodus and there's a lot of uh, good ones here. Uh, Exodus 12, 5 to t- uh, 10. Your lamb shall be without ble- blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it upon the two side posts and the upper door post of the houses 
wherein they shall eat it. And so, okay, so they're supposed to do this ritual over the doorway where they're supposed to eat this sacrificial uh, meat. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast, it, uh, roast with fire and unleavened ble- bread. And the bread becomes key. We're going to see the bread theme running throughout. And with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with the legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until morning, and that which remaineth of it until morning ye shall burn with fire. And then Leviticus 3, 6 through uh, 17. This one is a bit long. Uh, And if offering the sacrifice... uh, of peace, and this is a peace offering, ladies and gentlemen, a peace offering. And notice all of these you're supposed to burn with fire. What is a what is a holocaust? Well, it's a burnt offering. So, you know, and that's not that's not a German word, ladies and gentlemen. The word holocaust is not a German word. And we're gonna see a little bit how the blood of the lamb starts to play in through this for those who uh, want to read between the lines on that. But uh, so Leviticus 3, 6, And if his offering for a sacrifice of peace offering unto the Lord be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. Okay, it's got to be the most pure, the one that's without blemish. And if he offer the lamb for his offering, then he shall offer it before the Lord, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it before the tabernacle of the congreg- congregation. Congregation. And Aaron's son shall sprinkle the blood thereof around upon the altar. Okay, so see that we we see that these are blood animal uh, sacrifices that the Jews practiced uh, when they did these types of sacrifices. Jesus becoming the last sacrifice, and uh, we'll talk about that as we continue here. And he shall offer the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire, again, a burnt offering, unto the Lord. The fat thereof and the whole rump, it shall he shall take off hard by the backbone, and the fat that covereth inwards, and all the fat is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks and the call above the liver, with the kidneys uh, he shall take away, and the priest shall burn it upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire unto the Lord. And if his offering be a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of it and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle the blood thereof upon the altar round about. And he shall offer thereof his offspring, even an offspring made by fire unto the Lord. There's that word fire again. And the fat covereth the inwards, and all of that fat is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys And the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, which with the kidneys, it shall shall he take away. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire for sweet Savior. All the fat is the Lord's. It shall be a perpetual state for your generations throughout all your dwellings that ye eat neither fat nor blood. There's your low-fat diet origins right there. Uh, But don't go eating blood, folks. Good grief. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Ye shall eat no manner of fat of ox or sheep or of goat. And the fat, and this is Leviticus uh, uh, 7.23 and forward. And the fat of the beast that dieth of itself and the fat of that which is torn with beast may be used in any other use, but it shall in no wise eat of it. For whatsoever eateth of the fat of the beast, of which men offering an offering made by fire unto the Lord, even the soul that eateth it shall be cut off from his people. So, and then uh, here we go. Moreover, ye shall not, uh, ye shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be of fowl or of beast, in any of your dwellings. Whosoever soul it be that eateth any manner of blood, even the soul shall be cut off from his people. Okay, so wait a second. Vampires are cut off from the people. They're cut off from the rest of the society. They are banished. They're outside. They're, they're dead people. They're, so they're outside the regular community because they've consumed the blood. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 
Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, He that offereth the sacrifice of his peace offerings unto the Lord shall bring his oblation unto the Lord of the sacrifice of his peace offerings. So these are peace offerings, folks. These are holocausts. Each one of these is a holocaust. It's a burnt offering. Okay. So, you know, I'm not even going to say that. I mean, some of you can read between the lines. I'm not even going to say it. But, uh, you know, uh, even the OED spends the word holocaust as being originally a Greek word. I think that is a, a big farce. And uh, so uh, Leviticus 17.10, And wheresoever a man be that of the house of, Is- uh, house of Israel or the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and I will cut them off from his people. Again, there's the segregated vampire group that's never a part of the regular society. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I give it, to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh the, the atonement for your soul. Therefore, I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourn among you eat blood. So again, no one is allowed to eat blood. Of course, the Satanists see that and they go, hey, yeah, we got to go do that, man. Yeah, that's really cool because we're going to reverse engineer everything the Bible says because we're so smart. Oh my God, such childish mentality. And whatsoever a man be there of the children of Israel or of the strangers of that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, He shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust, for it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore, I say unto the children of Israel, ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. The life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Okay, so this is why they're eating this. This is why Satanists do this, because it's specifically ordered for them not to, and because they have no, you know, original thought but to do the antithesis. And then uh, eateth it, and they shall be cut off. Again, those who eat it are cut off from the rest of society, and every soul that eateth which died of itself, or that which was torn with beasts, whether it be in one of your own country or a stranger, he shall both wash his hands and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening or even, which is the evening, then shall be clean or then he shall be clean. But if he wash them not nor bathe his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. And then Leviticus 19, 26, and there's a few more here I want to get to. We're starting to get maybe. These are these are pretty good, though. It breaks it down because I really want people to understand what these blood sacrifices were, what they really meant, and understanding what the blood was and the sacrifice so that you begin to understand. And then we're going to tie it up to the eventual sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the true origin of the blood of the Lamb, right? So, And he takes the final sacrifice uh, for everyone's sins, so that we can all come to logos or truth. Uh, Behold, the people shall rise up uh, a great lion, and this is Numbers 23, and lift up himself as a young lion, and he shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. So here's an antithesis one. And, you know, I tried to figure out what the meaning of that was. I didn't get quite to it, but that one actually says the antithesis. Now going to Deuteronomy 12, uh, 15, Notwithstanding, thou may kill and eat the flesh in all thy gates, whatsoever thy soul lustest after. Here it is, folks. Notwithstanding, thou may kill and eat the flesh in all thy gates, whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. So if it's in the gates of your territory or land or property, you can kill any living thing that your soul lusteth after and use it for a sacrifice. According to the blessing of the Lord, so now we're getting to the sacrifice of people that, uh, you know, that were not of 
the group. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks, Bahera, for that. And uh, thanks, everyone, for your support. Uh, so there's a few more here I want to try to get to. And then so, you know, th we begin to see with this, uh, you know, <laughs> according to the blessing of the Lord, which he giveth thee, the unclean and then the clean may eat thereof as the roe and as of the heart. Those are roe buck and as of the heart. Those are two types of deer. And uh, as only ye shall not eat the blood, ye shall pour it upon the earth as water. Thou may not eat within thy gates of thine, of thy corn, or of thy wine, or of thy oil, or of the firstlings of the herd of thy flock. Of course, so there's the firstlings. Don't sacrifice the firstlings. Don't sacrifice the one-year-old. So what are the Satanists going to do? Well, they got to they got to go do that, you know. So that's that's they're so original. So uh, nor any of you thy vows uh, which thou vowest nor thy free will offerings or heave offering of thine hand and then Deuteronomy 12:22 forward even as the roebuck and the hart is eaten so thou shalt eat them the unclean and the clean shall eat of them alike. Only the, be sure that thou not eat the blood, for the blood is the, for the blood is the life. The blood is the life. Young blood, vampirism. They, they get, they live forever. The blood is the life. They're gonna get rejuvenated. They're gonna be young again. They're gonna be Sandra Bullock and these people talking about, you know, or, or no, that sorry, that was uh, baby circumcisions. Uh, uh, but there, this is the purpose of this. This is, ladies and gentlemen, this is all laid out in the Bible. This is why they don't want you to read the Bible because it's all laid out there. The blood is your life. If the blood is drained out of you, your life goes away. You can take your a liver, you know, you can take a kidney out, you can take lots of things out, and people will survive for a long time. You cannot take the blood out or the animal dies. Thou shalt not eat it. Thou shalt pour it on the earth as water. Thou shalt not eat it that thou may go well with thee and with thy children after thee. Okay, so if you don't eat it, your children will go on after you. And then thou shalt do which is right in the sight of the Lord. That which is right, that which is correct, that which is true in the sight of the Lord. Only thy holy things which, the, which thou hast, and thy vows thou shalt take, and go unto the place which the Lord shall choose. And thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, the holocaust, the flesh and the blood, upon the altar of the Lord. So you got to give the flesh and the blood upon the altar of the Lord. And the blood of thy sacrifice shall be poured out upon the altar of the Lord, and thou shalt eat the flesh. And then Deuteronomy 15, 19, And the first males that come of thy herd and of thy flock, thou shalt sanctify unto the Lord thy God, and thou shalt do no work with the firstlings of thy bullock, nor shear the firstlings of thy sheep. Thou shalt eat it before the Lord thy God year by year in the place which the Lord shall choose, thou and thy household. And if there be any blemish therein, if it be lame or blind or have any ill blemish, you shall not sacrifice it under the Lord. So you got to take the most pure uh, animal for your holocaust, for your burnt offering, for your sacrifice. They have to be the most pure, the most, you know, the, the purest blood of the lamb for the sacrifice. Thou shalt eat it within thy gates. The unclean and the clean person shall eat it alike as the roebuck and the heart thereof. Only thou shalt not eat the blood thereof. Thou shalt pour it on the ground as water. And then First Samuel, and here it gets really interesting because now we see they're getting high off of honey. So uh, and this is First Samuel 14, 26. But Jonathan heard not what his father changed, uh, the, charged the people with, the oath. Therefore he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his eyes were enlightened. And uh, then answered one of the people and said, Thy father straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Then Jonathan, My father hath troubled the land. See, I pray to you, how mine eyes have been enlightened, because I tasted a little of this honey, and I've done, uh, there's psychedelic honey as common bees eat flowers of, 
you know, they pollinate and get to gather the, the pollen of uh, psychoactive plants and it gets into the honey. And this was very common. In fact, a whole Roman army was laid to sleep eating uh, uh, some of this honey. So how much more if happily the people had eaten freely to this day of the spoil of their enemies, which they found for had there not been now a much greater slaughter among the Philistines, had they smote the Philistines that day from Mish Mikmash to Ajalon, and the people were very faint. And the people flew upon the soil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground, and the people did eat them with blood. So there's that, you know, they, they betray God. They ate the animals with blood. Then they told Saul, saying, Behold, the people sin against the Lord, and they eat with blood. And he said, Ye have transgressed. Roll a great stone unto me this day. And Saul said, Disperse yourselves among the people, and say unto them, Bring me hither every man his ox, and every man his sheep, and slay them here, and eat, and not sin against the Lord in eating with the blood. And all the people brought every man his ox with him that night, and slew them there. And then Psalms you know, uh, uh, good grief. You know, we're, there's probably like another page of this. But I'm just trying to lay the foundation so that people can really grasp what a blood sacrifice is, what vampirism is, why the vampires are rejected by God because they're consuming the blood, which is even against uh, the Torah and the Tanakh uh, and the Old Testament, etc., so Psalms 50, 12 forward, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls and drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the most high and call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. And then Ezekiel 33, 24 forward, son of man, Okay, what is Jesus again? Oh, son of man. Yeah. Huh. Oh, okay, they, they sacrificed him too, didn't they? Oh, yeah, son of man. They that inhibit those wastes of land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land, but we are many, and the land is given to us in, for inheritance. Oh, wait, they lost their inheritance, didn't they? They were all sent wandering for hundreds of years. And that's why they're trying to establish Israel and Palestine, because they lost the lands of their inheritance. And they're trying to recreate it falsely without earning the right back, without living in truth and accepting logos. Wherefore, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, and uh, ye eat with blood, and lift up your eyes toward your idols, and shed blood, and shall ye possess the land? So he's saying, ye eat with blood, ye lift up yourselves toward your idols, and ye shed blood, and ye shall possess the land, the land of your inheritance. He's saying, no way. Ye stand upon your sword, ye work abomination, and ye defile everyone, his neighbor's wife, and ye shall possess the land. Say thou, uh, say thou thus unto them, thus saith the Lord God, as I live, surely they that are in the waste shall fall by the sword, and him that is in the open field will I give to the beast to be devoured, and the day that be in the forest and in the caves shall die of the pestilence. For I will lay the most desolate, and the pomp of their strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be desolate, that none shall pass through. This is because they're eating blood and, and you know, doing this vampiric behavior. So this is why they lost their land inheritance. This is why they were sent wandering. This is why they were excluded from the rest of the people and the other tribes. Now it all starts making sense. We start to get the bigger picture, folks. You know, they weren't just the, you know, like, you know, I use the analogy, you know, it's always the good guy who doesn't get in any trouble at the party and doesn't start in any fights, etc., who always gets kicked out of the party, right? Oh, wait. No, it's not. It's the one who always causes trouble. So are the people who get kicked out of every country on earth the ones that are causing trouble or the good guys? You got to think. Ezekiel 39, 17. And the Son of Man saith the Lord, Speak unto every feathered fowl and to the beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. Hmm. And ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth. 
of the rams, of the lambs, of the goats, of the bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan. And ye shall eat the fat till ye be full and drink the blood till ye be drunken. Drink the blood until ye be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. Thus ye shall be filled with my table, with horses and chariots, with thy, with mighty men. I mean, this is talking about human sacrifice, it sounds like to me, ladies and gentlemen. With all the men of war, saith the Lord God. And I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed, and my hand that I have laid upon them. So shall the house of Israel know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity, because they trespassed against me. Therefore I hid my face to them and gave them unto the hand of their enemies. See, when you become a slave, folks, it's due to your own iniquity, not because somebody else is suppressing you. You got to get a clue, man, and stop blame casting. Good grief. So they fell by, they all fell by the sword. According to their uncleanliness and according to their transgressions, I have done unto them and hid my face from them. So they fell. They were the fallen people. They were the Judases, the, you know, Judases, Judaism, the judges, the, the judicial, that's the, fu- I mean, come on, put it together, folks. All right, here we go. We're finally there. Are we ready, Caleb? Mm-hmm. All right, so, okay, I mentioned the bread earlier and the blood. So now we're going to start to get the picture of the sacrifice that Jesus was. And uh, so, you know, Jesus was really the last sacrifice Jesus was calling an end to all of this crap, all of this vampirism, all of this blood libel, you know, murderous, sacrificing crap. And so this was to be it. And of course, those who rejected Logos or truth is God, they're still doing this behavior that we can see with Aldous Huxley and Al Hubbard and Humphrey Osmond and the you know, the 60s CIA hippie Satanists and all of that stuff. So John 6, 48, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread from which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Okay, so he's taking away the blood and he's saying, do it in remembrance of me. Do it all on me. If you eat the bread in in remembrance of me, you'll live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh and I will give for the life of the world. So he's like, just enough. This is it. You're going to do this in remembrance of me. Drink the wine, drink the water, eat the bread in remembrance of me. It's it. It's done. The Jews, therefore, strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give his flesh to eat? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, there it is again, and drink his blood, ye have no life left in you. No life. They're fallen. They've rejected Logos. They've fallen. They have no life left. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, the living Father, that's the heavenly Father, that's God, I live by the Father, that's truth, logos, and he liveth by me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven... Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Now, of course, that is all inverted and spun to go eat the the blood of children and everything to live forever, the young blood, etc. And we get into uh, Corinthians here, and then this is it. And this is Corinthians 11, 23 forward. For I have received the Lord that which... Also, I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus... The same night which he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he took the cup. And when he had uh, uh, supped, saying, The cup is the New Testament of my blood. The cup is the New Testament of my blood. Do this, uh, this do ye as oft as ye drink in, in remembrance of me. So he's like, you know, enough. He takes the cup. He sipped it saying, this cup is the New Testament. Forget your old covenant. Forget your bloodletting rituals. Forget your blood libel and your vampirism. This is what you're going to do from now on. It's done. And uh, let's see, continuing on, 1126. For as often as ye eat of the bread, drink of the cup, ye shew the Lord's death till ye come. Therefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So if you don't drink it, if you don't do it properly under logos and for truth, you're doing you're being you're going to be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So you're doing it in vain again, like the vampires. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, ye shall come together to eat, tarry for one another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest I will set in order when I come. So, you know, he lays it out and he puts an end to the whole thing and says no more of the uh, you know, blood sacrifices, and he sacrifices himself. And so thanks to uh, Bahare and Anthony and all of you who've donated, he says, I'm glad that you're using the principles of Scripture to expose the societal ills. People need to at least read the Bible with an open, critical mind. Very well said. You know, it's, it's essentially it's your owner's manual, so just get over it and, um, you know, read it. It's not going to kill you to uh to read it so see if i can close that thing i don't know what the heck it's not letting me close it now anyway go ahead caleb your turn so yeah man my so. my throat's <laughs> killing me after that so you gotta take it yeah that was uh that was a lot of good grammar there for us so um why do i keep bringing up the book of esther uh just to reflect here just to kind of make this a little bit digestible for people so as far as i'm concerned now that i've uh you know, I am very well aware of, of, of a lot of the different arguments. And the one that makes the most sense to me, as far as I'm concerned, the, the whole story of Esther is probably the best. It, w- when you take Fomenko's uh, breakdown and narrative into consideration, that's when you see in the, in the old times, these, all these rituals were banned, right? Then... All of a sudden, they start creeping back in. Well, the key to the whole book of Esther thing is that Esther was a Jewess who infiltrated in and got, that's how they got their bloodline involved in back into the empire. Before that, they were banned, right? So people are wondering, how did they get back in? Well, this lady Esther comes in, um, the whole story of Mordecai, her father, telling her not to tell anybody that she's a Jew. They they hide their religion. They hide everything. They tell her to lie, which, of course, Satan is the father of all lies. And you get, uh aha, okay, so they're Satanists. So then... What happens is they infiltrate. They she gets her bloodline to to get on the throne by killing people. Now, and if I'm also correct about this uh, Elizabeth lady, who you know at this point it's still speculation, I would say, but I've uh, I, I'm gonna put something together because I don't I don't think anybody's done this uh, put put this uh, connection together yet. Uh, I don't know. I haven't seen anybody else do the connection yet. So somebody's got to pioneer this work and do all the primary sources. But as far as I'm at right now, I'm, I, I don't think it's a stretch to say, so if this lady was as bad as we think she was, and she's actually a reflection of the story of Esther, so that's how you get this 
evil bloodline, this Bacchanalian cult who has been in the shadows, get back into the empire and then sub start to subvert. And then you see this flood and it goes over the whole royal family of, of, uh, of England and everything. And that's when you start to see uh, later on, like I was saying before, all these other characters come into play. Well, they have roots in this Bacchanalian uh, cult. Okay, so one other thing uh, involved in that that I wanted to uh, talk about real quickly. Let me just share this real quick. So, so you go over and you start learning more about the sacrifice of the cult of the bull. Uh, you start to realize uh, modern um, <laughs> historians, Scaligarian historians, uh, see, see, all these people are, get this wrong. They need to go get more, um, more grammar on the subject, and they'll figure this out. This Minoan civilization was a sea seafaring civilization that flourished in the Mediterranean, okay? And these guys are are worshiping the bull, the Minotaur. And, you know, so these guys are saying these Scaligerian chronologists are talking about the term Minoan refers to King Minos and all this stuff. Uh, the cult of the bull, you know, you, so I'm interested in where did all this stuff originate? Um, now, like I was saying before about the book of Esther, well, check this out. In the in the chapter previous to this was all the whole chapter of the book of Esther. And that's Here, uh, Fomenko. Why don't, why don't you tell him what book that is? This is how it was in reality. The same book I've been talking about most of this time as far as, you know, like I said, this is the best uh, way that I've seen. And I, you know, I'm open to more. But uh, as far as I'm concerned right now, this is the best I've seen as far as a reconstruction of history. I do, I do believe that our history has been completely jumbled up and, and, you know, misrepresented. And so piecing together the past is what I'm interested in. And none of the puzzle pieces fit unless you get some of the big uh, aha moments. And that's what, where I got them from how it was in reality and the first five books from Anatoly Fomenko. Uh, now I'll just share. So turns out again, the King Minos and the Minotaur are reflections of the dramatic events of the 16th and 17th century. When guess what? The story of Esther, Elena Volinchenka, uh, a heretic and Ivan, the terrible's lover, uh, they, what you, they, have the exact same story this whole story plays out in the same way it's another reflection so that's just another really interesting piece of the puzzle is the all these um worshiping of the bull keeps coming back to the story of esther uh who is elena volenshenka to read more to understand the book of esther even deeper i would recommend reading some of this stuff but what's really interesting is Jan actually found a lot of this stuff out on his own without reading any of this. And I, while he's doing that research, I'm doing my own research into Fomenko. Yeah, you know, our Holly, uh, Holly and I were researching uh, the book of Esther in relation to the Purim and the Puritans back uh, over the summer. You know, so all of this came up and it was extremely important. You know, it was like, you know, here we go. You know, and I, I knew the story was important. I hadn't you know, I'm I'm reading this same book of uh, uh, Fomenko's as well. I'm you know like 200 and some pages in, but I haven't gotten to this part yet. So yeah, it's great stuff. Yep. And so, of course, what do we see? We see the the Purim, like you were just saying before. The Purim, this holiday is a, is a Jewish dark holiday that celebrates them getting back in and winning the winning the uh that's holy war. okay so that's what they're actually celebrating there is they're getting their blood back into the royal bloodlines they're not celebrating the murder of ha haman per se they're celebrating exactly. the winning of getting into the royal bloodlines exactly and that's so so think about this so the esther is also just is so Esther is another name for Ishtar. Ishtar is the uh, supposedly the Sumerian, quote unquote, God, who this, it, when you read Fomenka, you realize who the Sumerians actually were. 
Uh, it's a lot different than you've been told. Um, but the, the, the whole story about the woman that, you know, this evil woman to us, but to the Jews is their savior it, that gets them the war back that up until this day, they're still winning against us is signified by, I would say the statue of Liberty, this, this goddess, it, could that be Esther? Could that be the lady, the, the most evil lady that we're talking about? Could this, could this Elizabeth lady that we were talking about, this vampire be a reflection of her? Um, these are the questions I have about, uh, uh, what actually is, is this vampire myth? Is, is, is it really, uh, an actual historical, you know, thing that, that we've been led to believe is this myth or uh, a bunch of movies. But anyway, so another thing to consider, uh, before I forget, I know we're coming up with, uh, we, we got to wrap things up pretty soon. I wanted people to know that the kosher industry, if you look into the kosher industry, um, you'll start, you'll, um, if you're like me, you'll be horrified. Um, the kosher industry is another uh, representation, I would say, of these these uh, rituals, blood, blood rights, it's and blood rights, exactly. Except do the you only want difference to, uh, is you want to cancel the share screen there if you're done. Yep, I'm working on that. <laughs> you got the wrong windows showing there. <laughs> you gotta hover over it's probably on the one of the top of your screens there dude just hit end share i can see the button down there on the bottom but you got to cover it up there on the right on the right there that one no nope. meeting controls and then there's a meeting controls nope nope back down on the bottom bar oh dude <laughs> that one right side click that right side click that Okay, somewhere on your screen, you have the red button that that is showing. You got to find it. Thank you. All right. Now get back on track. Yeah, so uh, the what I was just saying about the kosher industry, be careful when you look into it. It's pretty dark, and it's, it's, just, more, it's just more of this whole thing that we're talking about. It's just with animals. Um, you know, they're, they're completely savage-y, savage, <laughs> savage, savage when they cut the throats of these animals and just let them bleed out in there, who knows what else they're doing, but the videos I've seen on YouTube are pretty bad. Um, that's one thing I also wanted to mention. Uh, another thing, uh, circumcision, um, look into circumcision. It's, it's definitely a Jewish, uh, ritual that has continued, um, unfortunately throughout the western culture and you know i know a lot of people are controversial on that topic but look oh, well, into that well, as people, well. people you know what what makes me sick uh, caleb is all of these feminist women who freak out over the female circumcisions happening all the on the other side of the globe in africa but they don't give a damn about the other half of the population here in the united states that that crap is being done to you know it's like wake up man you know, it's like you, you freaking hypocrites. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's so that's what we're trying. That's what we're really trying to get to here is we're trying to piece together and try to figure out what uh, who is this enemy that has infiltrated, uh, you know, all aspects of our culture. And we, we're trying to take our culture back. And so unfortunately, we have to get kind of grotesque on some of these things uh i i don't like covering this stuff but uh it's a dirty subject somebody's got to do it and i'm glad people are bearing with us we have a whole ton of more information and grammar to bring out um i know i kind of just jumped over a lot of different things and i have i have actually a whole bunch of outlines set up to try to make videos um maybe put together some some notes with all this laid out so it's more digestible for people um let's see what uh anything else we were gonna mention oh, let's see i think uh that's probably it for me oh wait you know what i do have some more quotes here from 
Oh, wait, we haven't said it for a while. Ladies and gentlemen, Huxley. Ah! <laughs> All right. So uh, this is uh, Moksha again. Actually, the fact had been staring everyone in the face for several decades, but nobody, as it happened, had noticed until a young English psychiatrist at present working in Canada was struck by the close similarity in chemical composition between mescaline and adrenaline. Further research revealed that lysergic acid, an extremely potent hallucinogen derived from ergot, has a structural biochemical relationship to the others. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so wait a second. Mescaline, LSD, psilocybin, and adrenochrome from blood vampirism are all structurally biochemically, have a structural biochemical relationship. Then came the discovery that adrenochrome, which is the product of the decomposition of adrenaline, can produce many of the symptoms observed in mescaline intoxication. So when you hear of the frenzy of the vampire, of those who eat the blood, of the moil and all of this stuff, who do this stuff, this is what the frenzy is after, uh, about. It's not DMT. It's not like from the pineal gland or whatever. If, you know, even Rick Strassman's uh, Scottish Rite Freemasonry funded uh, research, uh, Rick Strassman's the, the uh, Jewish... Uh, a uh, researcher that uh, doctor in uh, New Mexico that wrote DMT, the spirit mo molecule, uh, you know, if his research is to be believed. But adrenochrome, it's it's not the DMT, it's the adrenochrome that they're after. So uh, let's see here. And then uh, Oscar Janiger, who is uh, the cousin of pedophile uh, uh, Allen Ginsberg, he says, and he was another MK Ultra operative for the CIA. He, he says it was uh, Oscar Janiger was a Beverly Hills psychiatrist. And this is uh, Jay Stevens from Storming Heaven, who preferred research to analysis, although he did just enough of the later to pay for the leisure to indulge the former. He also taught a few courses at a local university. And it was there in 1954 after a lecture synopsizing the Osmond Smythe's adrenochrome thesis that he was approached by a young man named Perry Bivens. Biv Bivens was a professor, professional diver. He worked for Ivan Torres, the producer of Sea Hunt, and he had his own private decompression chamber that he had built himself. It was while perfecting the chamber that Bivens discovered that he could alter his consciousness simply by changing the mix of gases. So, you know, um, he's studying Osman. You know, they're all in cahoots. He's studying Humphrey Osman, who was also MKUltra, who's Aldous Huxley's doctor, who's MKUltra, who's heading the whole thing, and they're, you know, studying other ways of uh, changing or altering consciousness. So then we start to see what all of this stuff is. This is Peter Stafford from, uh, shoot, you know, and we didn't even get into the uh, frenzied accounts that Gordon Wasson covered up and Diego Duran's 16th century reports on the Aztecs, blood rituals oh boy that uh we'll have to save that for part two mm -hmm. so uh you know but yeah gordon wasson tried to cover all of that up and make it all about a, a glorified uh, new age mushroom cult so high dose studies of rats suggest that psilocin which is the active drug from psilocybin uh psychoactive mushrooms uh, taken orally, which we got from Maria Sabina and the Mazatec and the Aztecs, etc., the, the death cult that was the CIA peddled is lovely. Orally is distributed through the body. Concentrations in tissues appear highest about a half an hour after ingestion, decreasing rapidly over the next three or four hours. The adrenal glands of test animals show the highest concentrations after the first hour until then, the kidneys have more. Mm -hmm. So when you take these, you know, psychedelic substances and mushrooms, the adrenal glands after the in the first hour or after the first hour are going to show the highest concentrations of the substances. Maybe because it's mocking, uh, mimicking adrenochrome. The small intestine, skin, bone marrow, lungs, stomach, and uh, salivary glands also have sufficient, con uh, significant concentrations, greater in fact than those in the brain. And then MDA, the archetype and simplest member of this cluster was, for, and these were all Peter Stafford from uh, this book here. I don't have the exact page numbers. I pulled them out of a PDF version. Sorry, if anybody needs the exact page numbers, send me an email and I'll dig them up. 
But uh, the archetype and simplest member of clusters was first synthesized in 1910 by G. Manish and W. Jacobson, who described the process in a German journal. It wasn't until 1939 that animal tests were performed, and then the team of Gunn, Gerd, and Sachs became interested in the substance while conducting adrenaline studies. Hmm. Hmm. Two years after another team, Lohman, Meyerson, and Meyerson thought this compound might alleviate Parkinsonism, but discarded the idea when the drug produced muscular rigidity in the single patient tested. And then uh, going on, uh, let's see. Bremble Chrome and Finder in their Hallucinogenic Agents, page 116, discuss the possible metaz- met- good read, metabolism routes, which adrenoglomerulotropine and, mal- and melatonin normally present in the, uh, present in the pineal body may be turned into 6 methoxy harmalon. Not harmaline, harmalan. So far, however, no evidence has conclusively shown that this conversion actually takes place in the human brain. So, you know, and then he goes on, as with DMT theories have been advanced that schizophrenics, that schizophrenia is associated with increased production of harmala alkaloids, which is like, you know, paganum harmala, et cetera, which is <clears throat> often used as a, uh, in in ayahuasca uh, analog brews, uh, as Sol- uh, Shulgin has remarked, and that's Sasha, Sasha Shulgin, who is DEA and Bohemian Grove, consensus among researchers now is that the approach is a red herring. And that's probably just Sasha Shulgin's own red herring to cover this crap up. And then, uh, you know, uh, Sasha uh, Sasha Shulgin created most of the designer drugs that are out on the streets today to screw up our youth and our brains. And then this one is from Sasha Shulgin Pekel. Also, there had been interest in reports that adrenaline had become an old and discolored, that had become old and discolored, seemed to elicit central effects in man. The oxidation produced products were identified as deeply colored indolic compound adrenochrome and the colorless analog adrenolutin. The controversy that these reports created just sort of died away. Hmm. You know, they probably want those vampire, you know, reports to just die off because if you get that, then you start seeing the upper strata of all of the child sacrifices and Pizzagate and all of this stuff that these people are doing on that, you know, on that top tier level there, you know, all the vampires up there, that's what, the, that's what they're doing. The controversy that these reports created just sort of died away and the adrenochrome family has never been accepted as being psychedelic. Hmm. No one in the scientific community to the community to today is looking in and about this area. Hmm, nobody is researched. So these not out in the public, except for maybe Osmond and Smythe's up there in Saskatchewan at the one mental hospital where they can extract people's blood and, you know, cause all kinds of craziness so that they can get this stuff. That's just my speculation, but I'm guessing that's exactly what they were doing. Mm. Uh, let's see. With uh, See, no one in the psych- psychedelic community today is looking in and about the, the area, and at present, this is considered as an interesting historical footnote. In other words, leave it in the past. Don't bring it up. Forget about that vampire stuff that all of these bloodsuckers like to uh, do and celebrate, you know. Mm -hmm. So there it is, folks. That's, That's the show for tonight. And we should be able to pull up a good part two on this. It is, of course, October... And, you know, for those of you who want to go back and get some more research on October, go back and see my show with Dr. Hans Utter, War of the Worlds, where we expose how they use fear and everything and the the manufacture of fear to manipulate people. And uh, Caleb, go ahead. So, uh, yeah, next time we'll try to cover things like uh, psychic vampirism. That's one topic we'd like to talk about. 
Um, another uh, thing that we'd like to talk about next time is a couple of references that I found uh, trying to figure out what the wolf reference could be about. Um, yeah, have a couple of ideas about that. Yep. yep. I've been digging around about that the last couple of days, trying to figure it out. Quite haven't gotten there yet, but you had pulled something from Fomenko to give some leads. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's so much misdirection out there. It's probably the same misdirection as vampirism and witchcraft and succubi mm -hmm. and, you know, and demons, which we're now starting to realize all of this stuff is real. It's just your understanding, you know. So yeah. if you think, you know, anybody who thinks this stuff is real is crazy. No, they're not. It's just your lack of understanding how this stuff is real. It's your your lack of depth. So Yeah. Yeah. And I'd like to. uh also talk a little bit more next time about um uh certain things that are that are very interesting to me um from a from a critical thinking aspect i'd really like to discuss channeling um certain things like possession stuff like this and uh, try to link that all into a, a show hopefully people will like like these topics it's october so uh, you know, it's not, there isn't a better time to get all this out of the way. <laughs> so get this dark stuff out of the way. And then uh, on a, just on a positive note, um, it, I don't want this to be fear porn or anything like that. I'd like people to, and I don't want people to, to play the victim and be like, oh, look at it, it's these, it's, you know, it's this group who's oppressing us. It's like, we got to do something. We got to stand up, be a light in uh, this uh, sea of darkness um hopefully we can melt these vampires with with some uh, sunlight with the light <laughs> of truth right there man yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah that's what vampires it's probably not even sunlight it's probably the light of truth that they can't stand right oh yeah you know, exactly. because then they get exposed for all of this stuff so yeah there you go and, you know and if you do run into a vampire shoot it with a garlic bullet or you know whatever you got to do <laughs> so. yes sir all right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks everyone for your support in the chat and all the super chats. Thank you, uh, thank you for showing some donations. In fact, we forgot to ask uh, those of you in the audience to uh, send uh, some donations uh, Caleb's way. Caleb, you want to give your your uh, donation address as well? Yeah, I just put it in the chat. It's M-I-C-K dot C-A-L-E-B at gmail.com. And by the way, guys, I, uh, you know, I'm trying to do full-time research right now. So if you have any questions um, as far as the research that I have, I'm trying to do my best to put it all together. So much grammar, but I love sharing it. So I have no problem. If you, if you uh, are interested in a little bit more, let me know. Um, and I appreciate anything. Thank you. All right. And that's it, folks. Have a good night. Take care. Bye.